Oh man, why did this year both fly by and tire me out? Thought we were just here talking about lawyers and bounty hunters. It was busy for me, you know, had a decent sized move, I broke my elbow, traveled a bunch to see some concerts, tons of fun. Well, not the middle one. But yeah, sorry for not being as active as I would have liked to be on this channel. Needed some mental health me time, along with just handling the aforementioned busyness. But I still had enough time to play some incredible games this year, and for one reason or another, some of the best ones were definitely things I didn't expect going into this year, so I was kept on my toes. Banger after banger it felt at times, though, damn. The busyness didn't just leave me a bit hard-pressed for making videos, but also for the quantity of games I played. I'd like to just blame my schedule, but in reality, the games that I liked, I played a ton of this year. Multiple games on this list have hour counts in the triple digits, so... Definitely more of a quality over quantity year, which is damn fine by me. Didn't play everything though, here's some of the cool stuff I missed. So don't call me out if they aren't on here. This is all my opinion anyway. Yes, here to share some good memories. Let me know what your favorites were down below. This also means that there were no real honorable mentions. Besides, uh, uh, oh, Cult of the Lamb. I'm not a big fan of roguelikes or management sims. But the fun combat, ease of access, and adorable presentation kept me hooked until the end. Oh, also, only one Pokemon game on this list, so assume that the other is an honorable mention. And, uh, I'd say that's all the formalities. Let's get right into my favorite games of 2022. To start off this list, we're going to be looking at the third main installment in what has quickly become a beloved Nintendo franchise. Splatoon 3 was announced after the second game had quite the successful run on Nintendo Switch, and it seemed Nintendo was eager to provide an update. The original take on a shooter via wonderful paint mechanics and world building has never felt better. While pretty much none of the core of Splatoon has changed here, that's really not a bad thing. Splatoon has been a winning formula in my eye since the very beginning, with only tweaks, minor additions, and some quality of life improvements necessary as time goes on. This update is no exception. There's been plenty of QOL changes with the lobby, changing equipment mid-match, map availability, all great stuff. The new campaign is a blast, as Splatoon's single player always is. The new card game is surprisingly fun, along with the new maps, weapons, and special attacks. It's as fun as Splatoon ever is, and I felt a similar feeling going from 1 to 2. All the series needs is some new charming characters, enough tweaking of the mechanics, and a unique coat of paint to feel, pun kind of intended, fresh. It's still so much fun to queue up with some friends in a general lobby or salmon run and have a great time without realizing how much time has passed. There are really only two reasons why Splatoon 3 is so low on this list. One, the fact that this just feels like another installment picking up where 2 left off without many changes can feel a bit bittersweet, especially in a multiplayer-centric game. Second, I haven't had a ton of time to play it. I played through the campaign and sunk some time in the matchmaking with some friends, but nowhere near as much as what I spent playing the two previous entries, especially on launch. But all that really means is I just wish I had more bandwidth to play this one. Still, my time so far has been a blast and I'm looking forward to splatting for the rest of what is hopefully a long lifespan with this one. I really wanted to fall in love with Tunic. The charming graphical style, the Zelda-inspired game design, and using the collectible instruction manual to progress all sounded wonderful. I wanted to love it, but in the end, I thought it was good. <laughs> Tunic's a very good game, and I can see how some would get totally lost in it. The atmosphere, music, and art direction is honestly pretty stellar. Plenty of the dungeon designs are great, and I love a lot of the ideas presented with the instruction manual and the self-discovery and unique puzzles. Though the Souls-like nature of the game isn't the best. The combat isn't too stand out. The dungeons can have some dead ends, and certainly some game progression choices, including the lengthy spirit form section, were questionable at best. The puzzle solving was a mixed bag. When it hit, it can be some of the most clever and rewarding head scratchers of the year, but other times it's incredibly frustrating. 
When you're stuck in Tunic, you're stuck for a while, but for the most part it's still a fun ride. I think if you're looking for an isometric Souls-like, play Death Store, though there's still plenty to enjoy within Tunic. If you are just looking to get to A ending, you won't have to get through too much of the insane puzzles, but that true ending, man? <sighs> I don't know. Honestly, I think I've warmed up to it over time, though. As a whole, I can really respect the nature of the puzzles and how they go about teaching the solutions. I think a lot of the ideas here are incredibly ambitious, and the manual itself works like 90% of the time. Some of the puzzles are nuts, but some of them are both complex and insanely rewarding to figure out. If anything, I think it's a wonderfully charming first attempt from the developer, and would love to follow them in future endeavors. They've got tons of great ideas that I would love to see polished. The game's aesthetic is incredibly charming, and I still found myself having a lot of fun. So if it looks appealing, give it a shot. It can absolutely be something you can sink plenty of time into, and one of the most complete indie experiences of the year. I enjoy rhythm games well enough, but it's been hard for me to really get into one of the cross-genre experiences. I often think they're really neat and creative, just too much for me to manage at once. This year though, I definitely found an exception in the form of Metal Hellsinger. Taking the arena shooters from Doom, Quake, and the like, and overlaying it with a stellar metal soundtrack to create something truly special. Shoot, slash, and reload to the beat and you'll do more damage, rack up the multiplier, and even reveal more layers to the track in the background. An addictive feedback loop that keeps you wanting to shoot on beat, revealing a new bass line, another set of guitars until finally the vocals kick in and you're riding a newfound high while playing a pretty well put together FPS. The game is so well designed with the rhythm in mind. Every weapon's shot and reload feels perfectly in time with the beat already, so just matching up the notes on key only feels natural. Mix in jumping and dashing, which also gives on beat bonuses, and you feel like a demon slaying machine with the gods of metal on your side. I was skeptical. As soon as I started the first level, saw the beat meter and, you know, the deflation when you miss a note, I wasn't so sure. But trust me. Find your preferred weapon and loadout combo, get in the zone, crank up the volume, and before long, it hits. The primary complaint is it can feel a bit formulaic. Eight levels with four primary waves each, plus some much appreciated challenges in between each level. I wouldn't say it's you've played one level you've played them all, but definitely you'll know whether or not this game is for you early on. It's not that long either, but I didn't mind. I felt it worked for this. It's a quality metal album in game form, an hour's worth of music stretched into a five or six hour game, with plenty of great musical guests and peak audio design. Reloads match the song's time, and they already feel like perfect beats to rip and tear to. The whole album really fits the campy metal opera vibe the whole game pulls off very well. It's a short but dense thrill ride. Brief, but that's not a detriment to it. I just think the game's higher on this list you can get a bit more out of. That being said though, your time is never wasted as you're slaying demons to the beat to some killer riffs and vocals. So in 2022, Game Freak decided to showcase a new vision for Pokemon not once, but twice. Opting to shift the long-running RPG Mega franchise to a more open-world style in their main entries. While experimented for a bit with the wild areas in Sword and Shield, now we are given full free-roaming worlds to explore in Pokemon Legends Arceus and Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. I was expecting that Legends Arceus was going to supply the experimental gameplay and then it would be used for feedback for a proper main entry, but uh, given the time between these two, I don't think that was possible. So which game is going to make it on my list? Well, I think it has to be... The one I'm not currently playing. Yeah, that's a cop-out, I know. But look, I'm only a dozen or so hours into Violet, and while I'm having a wonderful time, I can't judge it as a whole. What I can judge is the game I sunk a hundred hours into at the start of this year. Besides, going into 2022, Legends Arceus was poised in my opinion to be THE Pokemon game this year. 
and I felt like it got the spotlight snatched from it later on. I really enjoyed the new open world loop Legends Arceus had to offer. It got a little samey as time went on, but man, stealthily creeping around the world, peeking around a corner to catch a Pokemon in the wild with a third-person shooter-style Pokeball throw? There's some magic there that never really wore off. As someone who was always more of a fan of the collection aspect to Pokemon rather than the battling, I found myself right at home with a game that focused more on an expansive Pokedex to complete. Battles take a backseat, and that wasn't really an issue with me. Sure, the performance could be rough at times, but in terms of art direction, this is one of my favorites in the series. I love this watercolor painting style, both in the environments and the Pokemon themselves. It fits the world so perfectly. Exploring this world was a ton of fun and felt like a great transitional game between Pokemon eras, taking beloved elements and reworking them into a new, refreshing style. The story is a bit mixed, but I did really enjoy all the characters, and the side quests were a fun distraction. Sure, Scarlet and Violet may be better, and a more refined version of mechanics introduced here, but for now, I'm going to appreciate the enjoyable generational bridge that was Legends Arceus. Yep, Sonic Frontiers. It's on the list, and this high in fact. Sure, it's rough around the edges, the gameplay loop can get a bit repetitive, and aspects like mini-bosses and the cyberspace levels are a mixed bag. So why is it here? Because for about a week after I picked this game up, I couldn't stop playing this game. Every time I had a free moment in my day, I wanted to jump back into Sonic Frontiers. The feeling of running through all these environments from each little platforming challenge to the next, collecting everything in between, is not something that's going to click for everyone. For me though, it gave me a zen feeling of relaxation that few games managed to replicate this year, and definitely none this consistently. The feeling of growing up with older 3D Sonic games plus the Boost trilogy, having the nostalgia rushing back with an ambitious platformer that mostly hits the mark. It's absolutely a stepping stone, a first attempt at this new style for Sonic, but as a first attempt, it did what I wanted it to. It has some issues, like with the aforementioned cyberspace levels and the mini-bosses, but for me, that never killed the enjoyment. They were weaker elements, but I still enjoyed them. There were plenty of risks taken with Frontiers, and none felt like a complete failure. Just some things felt a bit unpolished. The open zone nature really worked for me. The new combat system was surprisingly well implemented that made me want to try new exciting combos that were incredibly satisfying to land. Also, the new writing style and direction were both a breath of fresh air. I for one enjoyed a lot of the little references sprinkled in, and the dialogue and characterization was a massive improvement for the franchise. I hope they keep Ian Flynn on for the long haul, he's been doing a great job. Also, the music was outstanding! Moody and melancholy during the explorations, while exciting and over the top during the spectacular boss fights. At worst, Sonic Frontiers can feel like a experimental stumble, but when it's at its best, it's the most memorable 3D Sonic has been in over a decade. For the first time in what feels like forever, I'm excited for what comes next for the little guy. Now, first off, I love Modern Kirby. The trilogy of games from the 2010s were some of the most consistently fun games in the series to me. But I, like many, were starting to see the cracks with Star Allies when that dropped back in 2018. It wasn't bad, just very apparent that this style had run its course for Kirby. It was maybe time to shake up the Kirby formula just enough to make his platformers feel fresh again. And so we have Kirby's first foray as a 3D platformer. Kirby and the Forgotten Land. This 2D to 3D shift is definitely not something as radical as some other well-known transitions, but the added dimension definitely provides enough to make this feel like something special. At its core, everything that makes Kirby a lovable and easy to pick up platformer is here. The copy abilities with satisfying combat, the collectibles, the level progression, it's all here. But the new level design, 
offers some great shakeups to the formula that kept me engaged the whole way through. What helps is the consistent platforming goodness interspersed with other new ideas, a charming hub world, copyability upgrades, and the creative mouthful mode. Things like the post-apocalyptic world and the neat story were a fun bonus as well, as is often the case with Kirby games, with plenty of great new and returning characters to round out this adventure. It's just so consistently solid all the way through. And there isn't a whole lot more I can add, but that also means there really isn't anything for me to criticize. For the first attempt at a Kirby 3D adventure, it really checks off all the boxes. There's a lot to enjoy here. Whether you're breezing through an engaging platformer, or trying to be thorough in a 100% completion run, you'll have a fulfilling time with this one. One of the most reliable games this year, I can recommend Forgotten Land to just about anyone, and expect them to play through with a smile on their face. I gotta say, following the founding of Tokyo Games and Kotaro Uchikoshi's subsequent departure from Spike Chunsoft, I thought that's where we were going to leave things with Uchikoshi's former visual novel IPs. I didn't really mind. I loved them to death, but I thought it was fine where both Zero Escape and I the Somnium Files ended, and I looked forward to seeing what Uchikoshi would do in the new studio. But to everyone's surprise, we received word that I, the Somnium Files would be receiving a sequel, Nirvana Initiative, with Uchikoshi returning as writer. I definitely wasn't expecting this considering I, the Somnium Files very much worked as a standalone game, without really any loose ends. A little ironic considering this is the first real direct sequel from Uchikoshi. What do you mean, Krimek? Well, obviously he's made sequels, but in this case, we aren't missing a beat. Set six months after the first game with the same art direction, game design, UI layout, you name it. It doesn't really mean that's bad, I love I. I know I said that the first game didn't need a sequel, but that doesn't mean this game feels forced. It's a new standalone story that doesn't require knowledge of the previous game, though I think it does help. It's a great excuse to return to this world, with its wacky concepts and characters. What made I-1 so great is once again on full display here. It's incredible writing and voice acting, the full emotions that the twists and turns of the story take you, and the neat abstract concepts that the ideas of going into dreams presents. It's great to come back to this beloved setting. Both the way old characters are integrated, as well as new characters are introduced, was carried out splendidly. Going a dual protagonist approach, splitting time between fan-favorite Mizuki and lovable newcomer Ryuki was a great experience. The themes and story feel both somehow unique to Nirvana Initiative, but also consistent to the greater I the Somnium Files series. After beating I-1, I wouldn't have desired an I trilogy, but now seeing how well this anthology format works, I think I kinda do. Uchikoshi is also just the writer this time around. The director Akira Okada and his team brought some much welcome alterations, I feel. The flowchart is a bit more streamlined as a whole, navigation feels snappy, and probably most importantly, the Somnium segments are improved. They weren't bad before, but now, instead of somewhat stressful, esoteric puzzle solving, Somniums are now more comprised of fun gimmicks. I really feel like the cryptic nature is sacrificed for more thematically appropriate puzzles, even if they are a bit easier. My only real issue with I, Nye is that if you didn't like the first game, I don't think you'll be convinced with this one. And if you did like I, 1, well, you've probably already played this game, and I don't have to recommend it. If you don't fall into either of those camps though, it means that you haven't tried the series at all. Which, in that case, give it a shot. It's crazy, emotional, and are some of the most quality visual novel experiences you can play today. Oh man, I was not ready for just how good Neon White was. This puzzle FPS was insanely more fun than I had originally anticipated. 
Using traditional shooter mechanics mixed with cards that give you both more guns and a single-use movement option works beautifully with the fast-paced level design that this game implements. It stays refreshing from beginning to end, with new enemies, cards, and unique layouts that keep me looking forward to the next level of this stylish adventure. And of course, within each of those levels, it's insanely fun to find each collectible, discover new strategies, and lower your times. The medals you can obtain through stringing together better runs with this fluid gameplay loop makes this game so satisfying to fully complete. Plus the bonuses of optional challenges along with level rushes that kept me playing for hours. Seriously, I put in so much work to optimize level times, not just because I wanted the new records, but because Neon White felt so good to control and speed through. I had a lot of fun with this game's presentation too. A warped version of the afterlife, where you take control of a recently dead, nameless killer, who is trying to earn a ticket to heaven by taking care of demons. While the story gets kinda nuts, it's got its moments, and most of the time the writing is solid. Plus, the characters themselves are really endearing to see interact with each other. They've got a great selection of voice actors, and I love the pastel designs with their masks. I enjoyed this world quite a bit, especially as the glue that tied these gorgeous and fun levels together. Oh, and my god, the music on this game! Ah! A fiery mix of electronic punk tracks to have you dash and shoot your way through that just fits so well with the entire aesthetic of the game. Influences include Jet Set Radio, Ape Escape, All Toss in a Break Core Blender, and yeah, it's as good as that sounds. Fun fact, I actually saw the composer's Machine Girl live in a basement concert hosted by a friend when I was in college. And look at them now, creating what is probably my favorite OST of the year. In fact, let's check out that list. Here you go. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably my favorite. Everything about this game is so addictive. The movement, the presentation, the replayability, it's so good. Try this game for yourself. It's easily my favorite indie game of the year and wholeheartedly worth your time. I've tried a couple of times to get into From Software games. As an outside observer, it's easy for me to see the appeal. The simplistic at the surface but surprisingly deep combat, the rewarding level design, and the sprawling lore. But there's always something that's turned me away. I tried Dark Souls, I tried Bloodborne, and it never sucked me in. The combat and the punishing nature, it's hard to say, but I was never quite convinced. So much so that Elden Ring wasn't even on my radar for 2022. Glad other people were hyped, but nah, I think I'm good. Then the praise started pouring in. I learned more and more about it, and some time opened up in game release schedules, so what the hell? Let's try it. And, well, Elden Ring is one of the greatest video games I've ever played. Where to begin? I was almost instantly hooked. The first hours exploring Limgrave, making it through the mini dungeons and getting through the opening segments felt incredibly rewarding. It was so gratifying to finally get it. Landing backstabs, barely making it to a site of grace before dying, finding a build that fit the playstyle, it all felt right! The Lands Between is one of the most engaging worlds to explore every nook and cranny in. Even with ample warning, I was not prepared for just how expansive this world was. An overworld spanning miles, multiple different underground cities, dungeons within dungeons, and yet it never felt overwhelming. The transition of Miyazaki Souls likes to open world worked beautifully because it brought out the best of both genres. The Souls-like nature of the open world allows the player to compartmentalize areas into various levels and challenges to avoid being overwhelmed. But in the other direction, the open world allows for even more player freedom in a From Software game, along with more accessibility. If something is too challenging, you are actively encouraged to go elsewhere in the world and explore to get stronger. That approachability went a long way for me. Not just in the exploration encouragement, but also the sights of graces, fast traveling between graces, and having more conveniently located graces before bosses makes this so much more engaging for a player like me, while still getting all the rewarding feelings that come with a FromSoft game. I get it now, the dungeon designs, the boss layouts, the intricate lore, it's all so easy to get lost in and appreciate. Presentation-wise, it's a masterpiece. 
The whole world is so varied and gorgeous with new places to explore at every corner. Every time you think you've hit the game's edge, it keeps going. From Software has done a sublime job in making the worlds feel lived in. A ruined civilization where every detail feels purposeful, meaningful, and worthy of your exploration. The lore is so, so expansive. Whether you want to experience it at surface level, or dive deep into descriptions and hidden clues, it's engrossing nonetheless. The music and audio cues are superb as well, gripping you into these lands and refusing to let go. A fantastically moody and ambient soundtrack that fits your adventure so well. It's hard to perfectly capture how much I fell in love with this world and design. As someone who didn't have intentions of playing this game at all, to go from that to sinking nearly 200 hours into it, to fully explore the entire game and get every trophy the game had to offer, it's going to leave an unforgettable impression. It's made me want to jump back into other Soulsborne games to give them another shot. I get the rewarding combat, the satisfying feeling of being transported to a dark fantasy world and overcoming the odds to conquer these challenges. I love this game to death. Every character, location, boss gave me so many memories that will stick with me for years. A magnum opus for From Software, a masterpiece in the genre, and an accomplishment for video games as a whole. <sighs> Wait, what do you mean we have one more? This isn't number one? What could possibly be next? What the fuck? It's so hard to summarize what Xenoblade Chronicles 3 means to me. I always feel like my favorite game of the year is the one I have the most to say about, but I struggle to accurately put it down to paper. How do I summarize the finale of the major arc of one of my favorite franchises of all time? I love Xenoblade Chronicles. 2 is very special to me, and 1 is one of my absolute favorite games of all time. To finally have Monolith Soft's next project be revealed, a new mainline Xenoblade game combining the worlds and futures of XC1 and 2, it felt unreal. Not much surpassed the hype for it in my mind between announcement and release. That's what you gotta understand about this in the last entry. Elden Ring shattered my expectations when I didn't really have any. Xenoblade 3 shattered my expectations when I had everything to look forward to. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 appeared like it was going to keep everything that made the series magical, take the best of both of its predecessors, and bring its own unique spin on everything. Somehow, it managed to succeed at all three. This world is expansive and gorgeous, one of the best looking games on the Switch, while still keeping the performance steady throughout, whether in handheld or docked. The progression through each of this game's areas that present themselves as an amalgamation of one and two landmarks creates something mesmerizing on their own, but also deeply nostalgic for what came before. Finding every secret was a blast, as always is the case with Xenoblade. The gameplay is a perfect combination of one and two. There's an emphasis on streamlining, keeping streamlined art palettes from two while keeping a more streamlined party system from one. Sure, the entire combat system feels like a complex machine, but that's just because of the amount of parts. Each part individually is incredibly intuitive and customizable. The various different art systems, the new movement options, and the Ouroboros linking is so quick to understand and enjoy. Normal arts, master arts, fusion arts, chain attack. It all feels so good no matter the class. And the classes, ah, this is a perfect evolution of 1 and 2. Introducing a 7th party member that can be swapped anytime, learning the class, and then applying it to any other PC. Brilliant. A perfect means of customization while not being overwhelming. And leveling each up really satisfies the completionist within me. Oh, and having the whole party fighting at the same time, with free switching whenever? Icing on the cake. The exploration and combat is everything I could ask for in an RPG, and then some, engrossing me with its systems and its world, making it one I wanted to stay in and complete everything. And I mean everything. 
The hundreds of quest lines and optional bosses were so much fun to check off and felt like a challenge all the way through. The pace is completely up to you. Anyone can hop in and get something special out of this one. I poured hundreds of hours into collecting everything, exploring everything, and maxing out stats in everything. I couldn't get enough of playing this game every day. And then there's the rest of the presentation. A sweeping score. Completing the tradition of the absolute cream of the crop soundtracks that come with being a Xenoblade Chronicles title. The motifs are spot on. The environment themes match the beauty and vibes of these wonderful locales with precision. And the battle themes stand among the best in the genre. No stranger for this series, but it makes it a standout of the year. And the... Ah, the story. This isn't just the best party system in the series, it's the best party. From beginning to end, these characters evolved into some of my favorite I've experienced in any story. The six here, these guys, I adore them so much. My children, god damn it, I love them. So lovable to see in action and wonderful to watch grow, learn about themselves, each other, and their world. It's peak Xenoblade. Not to mention the supporting cast. Simply no misses out of any of the heroes and villains. I love seeing everyone on screen, and the performances here are top notch. The tale woven in this game is sublime. One of the most beautiful experiences I've ever been a part of. The emotions I had playing through its entirety. I screamed, I laughed, I cried, and I'd do it all again. Especially this year. For me, these times in my life, there were so many messages I needed to hear, told through this game, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Finding friends where you least expect it, finding your own reasons for making you smile, and most importantly, just keep moving forward. All told with some of the greatest cinematography and delivery I've seen in a video game. Everything, the world, the themes, the characters, combined to create the peak ARPG experience for me. This is why I play games, for these moments. I hope that I'm not the only one who had a journey like that with their favorite game of 2022. For me, that game of the year is easily Xenoblade Chronicles 3, one of the most perfect games I've ever played. Take care of yourselves, guys, and walk on.